Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning is the Gospel lesson. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. We read these words again in the name of our Lord. As they went on their way, Jesus came into a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who was sitting at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her serving. She came over and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered and told her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. In fact, Mary has chosen that better part which will not be taken away from her. These are the words of our text. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have come into your house to hear your holy word and to be strengthened in our faith. Reassure us then that Jesus is our Savior from sin, that through his life, death, and resurrection, we are forgiven. Father, we also pray that you would increase our dedication to your word. Help us with your spirit to make it a part of every day so that we would be strengthened and preserved in our faith to the very end. Grant us your spirit to these ends. Sanctify us through the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed. Life is full of choices. That cliche actually trivializes the reality of life. It doesn't properly uh, convey the magnitude of the truth that it is proclaiming. We might say to someone, life is full of choices. Hurry up, make up your mind. Life is full of choices. Some of them are trivial. Like, what socks should I wear today? Some choices are of such profound meaning and destiny-changing results that we should shudder to consider them, let alone make up our mind about them. What or whom should I marry? Should I marry? Life is full of choices. I know from my own experience that some of the choices I make are better than others. In fact, we tend to evaluate and rank our choices. Might be, I should have chosen the chocolate Zanzibar ice cream instead of the orange sherbet. I should have worked hard in college. I shouldn't have lied. I should have been a better spouse. I should have been a better parent. I should have kept my word. We evaluate and even rank the choices that we make. Clearly, there is a standard that we apply. A standard by which we judge our choices. What then is our responsibility as we make our decisions in our choice-filled life. To choose the better part. Our responsibility is to make the best decisions possible. To choose the better part. 
the three people in our lesson today had choices to make. Let's see who chose what is better. Our text begins by telling us that Jesus was traveling and he came to a village. And in that village, a woman named Martha made the choice to invite Jesus into his home. We don't know what caused Martha to make that decision. We would assume that she had heard Jesus teaching and wanted to honor him by inviting him into a home. Putting the best construction on, on it then with Martha desiring to honor Jesus, it's easy for us to see why once Jesus got to a home, she got busy serving him. She wanted to be the best possible hostess for her honored guest told that when Jesus got to the home, he made the choice to begin to teach. Martha's sister Mary sat at Jesus' feet listening to his word. Now you can probably also understand why Martha felt the way that she did. There she was, busy trying to serve the Lord, and her lousy sister was just sitting down doing nothing. Maybe you felt the same way about someone at one time or another. So Martha wasn't going to take this. She made the decision that she was going to confront the situation and go straight to the top. She went to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me? To serve alone? Tell her to help me. Now Jesus was faced with a choice. How would he handle Martha's complaint? Jesus chose to very personally speak the truth to Martha. You'll notice the difference in approach between Martha and Mary. Excuse me, Martha and Jesus. For Martha, her sister was the nameless one, my sister. But Jesus very personally says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. Jesus very personally, in a concerned way, presented Martha with the truth. That she was worried and upset about many things. But one thing is truly needed. He continued, In fact, Mary has chosen that better part which will not be taken away from her. Jesus lovingly laid out the truth for Martha to see. Jesus was showing Martha that her priorities were wrong. There was something more important than serving the Lord. It was to be served by the Lord. See, that's really the difference between Mary and Martha. Martha thought the highest priority was serving this honored guest, this great teacher. Mary realized the most important thing is for me to be served by my Lord and Savior. So she chose what was better. Because she chose to sit at Jesus' feet and listen to him. God's word is the better part. So why is God's word the better part? God's word is the better part 
because it cares for something that nothing else can. Martha was concerned about the physical needs of Jesus. You could see her there bustling around in the food preparation area, cutting and dicing and preparing. You could see her running around the house, getting the room ready. She was concerned about the body of Jesus. But Jesus was concerned about the soul. The soul of Mary and the soul of Martha and the soul of all. And God's Word is the only thing that can care for our souls, that can feed them and nourish them, that can give them life. So God's word is the better part. Because one day our bodies are going to die. doesn't matter how hard your mom and dad work to feed and nourish you, provide a home for you, one day you're going to die. doesn't matter how hard you work and hustle and bustle to feed your body and surround it with good things, one day it's going to die. And when your body dies, the only thing that will matter is God's Word. Do you have the life that God's Word bestows? Now God bestows that life through the proclamation of His Word. He cares for our souls by first of all showing us our sin, our need for a Savior. He shows us all that we've done wrong, or I, sh I should say, He shows us part of what we've done wrong because we can't even see everything that we've done wrong. He shows us that we've violated His law time and time again and deserve to die, not just temporally, but eternally. And in showing us our sin, He shows us our great need for a Savior. And God's Word doesn't disappoint it doesn't show us a need without fully satisfying it. So God's Word also shows us Jesus. It tells us that God loved and cared for us so much. God wanted us to live eternally. So He Himself became a man lived a perfect life, died an innocent death and rose again, all in our place. That is, all for our benefit. So that now, what our soul needs is fully supplied in Jesus. Your sins have all been paid for. Your sins are all forgiven. God loves you and wants you to spend eternity with Him in heaven. Only God's Word can teach you that. Only God's Word can bestow that life and care for your soul. That's why it is the better part. In fact, it's the best part. So choose the better part. Choose God's Word. And be like Mary. Sit at Jesus' feet. Is God's Word then important? No, it's not. But let me explain. Let me use two other parallels to show you that God's Word is not important. Is breathing important? No, it's not. Breathing is essential. If you don't breathe, you die. Breathing isn't important. It is essential. Is eating important? No, it's not. 
It is essential. In the very same way, God's word is not important. It is essential. Without God's word, you not only will die, but you are dead spiritually. Only God's word can impart eternal life. Therefore, God's word is essential. And if you grasp that truth, if you acknowledge that that is correct, then you have to ask yourself, am I living as if God's Word is essential? Now that's an interesting question because it forces you to map out your life and how you're living, the choices that you're making. Are you making them in conformity with that truth that God's Word is essential, not just important? And if you were to follow that out, you may come up with an ideal in your mind about what your life would look like if you were living as if God was, God's Word was essential. Now, if you're like me, you tend to go to this ideal situation and I'm so far from that, how am I going to get to it? And what we need to do is to break it into little steps. I'm pretty sure that most of us would agree that if we were living as if God's Word was essential, we would be in church every Sunday, every opportunity. But many of us are far from that. So how do we get to that? Well, look at where you are now. Maybe you go to church once a month. If your goal is to be in church every Sunday because God's Word is essential, then you need to take little steps to get there. So if you're at one Sunday a month, you could say, okay, for the next three to six months, I'm going to go to church twice a month and establish the habit of going twice a month. And then once you reach that goal and you've established that habit, then you could say, okay, the next three to six months, I'm going to go to church three times a month. And you get that habit established. And maybe there's a month where you go once and you kick yourself in the pants and you get up and you you reestablish the goal. And you establish the habit of going three times a month. And then... You reach that goal and say, okay, now we've got to take the next step. I've got to go four times a month. And what seems like an impossible goal so far out there, six to 18 months later is something that you've realized in small incremental steps. Now another area that you might look at is your family life. Am I living as if God's Word is essential And am I showing my family that God's Word is essential? What would I do if I wanted to do that? Well, I think most Christians would say, I need to make God's Word part of my family on a regular basis. I need to be sharing God's Word with my family and and praying with them. So then you can think about, well, what would that look like? What could I do to implement that in my family? What small steps can I take today so that eventually I can reach that ideal? And so maybe your family doesn't pray at mealtimes. Okay, we're going to start praying at mealtimes. Maybe your family doesn't have meals together. That might be something that you want to reconsider. Because family mealtimes are a great time to pull out the Bible and pray together. Obviously, if you're going to reach for a new ideal, there's going to have to be changes. And those changes are going to be difficult. Not only because you're establishing new habits, but because we have a sinful nature that hates God's Word. 
you're going to have to fight that sinful nature tooth and nail to live as if God's word is essential. But making God's word a part of your life is going to have great benefits. The chief one is this, that you will hear again and again that God loves you and forgives you. Often when we think of studying God's Word and making it part of everyday life, we're thinking of we've got to learn the rules so we can live the way that God wants. No, what we need to hear is that God loves us. That Jesus has taken away our sins. Isn't that what we want our kids to hear again and again? That God loves them. That he sent Jesus to live and die for them. That's why God's word is essential. And that's why we should live as if it is essential. So your life is full of choices. You made a choice to get up this morning, put those socks on, whatever ones they were. And you made the choice to drive to church. You have many choices to make. Choose the better thing. Choose God's Word. And live as if God's word is essential. May God grant you each a rich measure of his spirit so that you would make the better choice. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.